Good morning. Am I on? There we go. How are you guys doing today? Yay. It's our Friday today. What? It's our Friday today. This time, right? We don't have class on Friday, so today is Friday for us. All right. And uh, you guys had yesterday off, so it didn't, it didn't affect me. I was still here too. Um, in fact, I, I wrote you guys. I didn't even remember it till yesterday morning. I was like, it's a reading day today. Okay. I don't teach on reading day, so it didn't, you know, it didn't affect me. Um, let's see. I, I saw these today in the, outside my office, and so I grabbed the stack over and I hand them off to you guys. So um, it's that it's it's that it's always that time of the semester when things seem kind of crunchy and life gets hard and the holidays are coming up and that's hard for some people and um, and if it's not affecting you you know people that it's affecting so as psych students you guys should be among the most knowledgeable of the options and resources here at the university so i got some little flyers for counseling and psychological services that uh, we're looking at. So, um, I'm going to set some of the security and I'm going to set some of the security and somebody is going to say, this is the whole file, so I'm not going to work. Somebody that you know, like, I think this person should be aware of. So, um, we have, uh, in, my, in my estimation, in my understanding, we have an outstanding counseling and psychological services system. And uh, uh, for most things, it's free, which, is, uh, which will become you know, something that will not be available for you someday. It will be very, very costly for those kinds of services. In some things, uh, after a certain number of visits, I think they start to charge it down. But um, for most things, it's, it's, it's a free service for your students, built into your exorbitant tuition, of course. But, um, and there, I just thought, I thought, I thought that was a good looking flyer, and I thought my students should know about this, and their friends should too. So I'll tell you what, um, Laura, would you mind putting them like in the, put them on the back table <laughs> for me? Sorry, you have to run around. And um, if after what I just said, or if you change your mind, or if you're not here and you walked in late, <laughs> um, go out on the back table on your way out, grab this man with some wish. Okay, I'll put yours back if you want to recycle it. <laughs> okay, so um, I just thought you guys should be aware of that. All right, um, I, had a, I had a nice segue from my song that I was gonna do, but you know, technology. So, um, that song has a has a has a line in it. You're a rock star. And we're going to talk about a rock star today. But first, I want to um, say a few things about the very end of the chapter on decision making. All right. So I'm skipping. Well, I'm not totally skipping the intelligence section. I'm going to talk about animal intelligence today. That's going to be our main theme. Um, I wanted to spend five or less minutes um, talking about maybe um, the most interesting part of the chapter: um, decision making. Um, in other words, kind of like thinking, neuro, the neuroscience of thinking, the neuroscience of what makes us, you know, human in the first place, really. So, um, um, and this is, this is, you'll, you'll have, I hope you'll have noticed that this is a very brief portion of the chapter. Um, and as I said, it's probably, it, it maybe ought to be the most interesting or the most, uh, the most researched area of all of psychobiology, but um, there it is. It's a brief, that tells you something about the, the state of affairs on this. This is the most complicated stuff I, I, I know of that we do as humans. So um, it's the, it, 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 well, it, um, it needs more research. Why am I getting a little note of set up professional audio? And I don't want that, but anyway, get rid of that little message. Okay. Um, anyway, so forgive my, uh, uh, I'm not going full screen on this. So for the Zoom recording, I'm trying all these different things to see what makes for the best recording here. So I'm trying this one out. 
Um, so anyway, uh, uh, decision making. All right. So um, I'm going to speak very incoherently about this because, again, this is sort of um, trying to still the sketchiest part. So uh, first and foremost, if you walk away from this, just realize like, hey, there's gobs of stuff, gobs of stuff largely in the frontal area of your brain that's involved with decision-making, thinking, and so on. And lots of interconnectedness, and there's no like little nugget that's like, hey, there's the smart nugget. There's the thing that does all the decision-making for us. So it's an interconnected, uh, complex web, and it involves some structures that are gonna perhaps take you by surprise, all right? So decision-making, all decision-making involves essentially two steps. I mean, you, you, you assess um, the, the options and the, the, the values and maybe the costs and benefits if it's that kind of a decision that you're making. And then a choice is made. A choice is made as to how to behave and not behaving is, a cert, is a, of course, certainly a choice. Um, so, uh, yeah. All right. Okay. So I've talked about our, you know, one of our stars, the amygdala is going to be crucial in this. I, I think I've, I think I've gave, I think I've mentioned the, the challenge that I sometimes only half jokingly give students to come up with anything, anything, any decision, anything that you do, anything that you do that ultimately is not fear-based. You know, the amygdala is very, it's maybe its biggest role is assessing fear, assigning fear, especially assigning fear to stimuli and memory of those stimuli and, and, and uh, situations. You know, remembering what almost hurt us, made us sick, killed us. Okay, remember, you know, don't do that again. Don't eat that again. Don't go there again. Watch out for that thing again. Don't jump off that. Don't, you know, don't, don't poke that critter. <laughs> you know, so if you can think of something that ultimately doesn't have a fear origin. Let me know. Okay, you're gonna challenge me. <laughs> like waking up. Waking up? Yeah. Um, well, I'm gonna say like something that's kind of challenging, or you know, something that's um, um, not just, I don't know, like you don't, you decide to get out of bed, but you don't decide to wake up. You're not, you're not, you're not usually, most people don't usually lay there asleep going, you know what? I think I'm going to wake up now. Okay. So I'm going to take the decision making out of that, you know, example. So um, then, then I, I'll, okay, I'll, 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 I'll take it to the next level. So then you have, then you decide to either sleep some more or get out of bed. That's fear-based. You assess what you have to do. Will I be late? Do I have to get somewhere? Do I blah blah? You know, every, you know. Ultimately, I'll say there's there's fear behind that. <laughs> okay, even if it's like, hey, I can't wait to get to psychobiology. There's fear of missing psychobiology. <laughs> so even things you like and love, you know, you do because you're afraid of not having the thing that you like or love, or you know, you know, uh, eating it or experiencing it or being with that person. Or, okay, so. Um, some people say like, you know, love, love is not fear. I'm like, yeah, it is. It's all about fear. It's fear about, it's fear of losing that love or not having that love in the first place or dying alone. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, this is very cynical. I mean, anyway, I'm just, you know, I don't only, uh, you know, anyway, I'm just, I, I think I made my point that, you know, when you stop and honestly think about it, fear is an important mm, motivator or component to any decision, all right? I think I also mentioned once my time, um, you know, the ancient Star Trek, you know, original Star Trek, you know, with Spock from, you know, from, you know, planet Vulcan, half Vulcan, half human. And he was always struggling on the show, you know, Vulcans have given up, you know, they've evolved so highly that they're, you know, they're surprisingly just like humans they're just pointy ears and green blood, apparently. Okay, that's the only difference between Vulcans and, you know, an entirely different planet, Lord knows where. And, you know, this is this amazing coincidence that they evolved separately, to, you know, be exactly like us. And they can even breed apparently with us, okay, because Fox a half Vulcan, okay, half human. Anyway, the, uh, if you're not familiar with the show, he's always struggling with, um, you know, emotions, you know, the half of him that's still human still has emotions. And, you know, they're all supposed to be logical and every decision is supposed to be devoid of emotion. Well, that's absolutely that's a fun science fiction premise and you know makes for uh, you know one of the one of the most amazing characters in the history of television but um you recognize the silliness of it as a especially you know 
you know, you can't make a decision without without emotion. Uh, you just don't. It's just it's it's the it's the it's the value that's added to the, the you know the, the choice of behaviors ultimately has to do with emotions. Okay, enough about the amygdala. So um, it's going to be a big juicy kind of, you know character in this process, connected all over the place. Um, it's a tiny little thing, you know, probably only big, you know, maybe smaller than the first little joint of your thumb. And it's not like type of an almond, yeah. <laughs> it's almond shaped and almond size. And, um, and uh, but it's like one of the most connected structures in the brain. I mean, it just seems to be connected to everything, especially up there in the front of the bus. All right, the hypothalamus, guess what? You know, important for, you know, all those behavioral choices that you make to propagate, to survive, to exist, all right? Um, decisions ultimately about propagating and, you know, continuing to exist, okay? So needless to say, the hypothalamus um, and all of its juicy nuggets are connected to this process and network. All right, so then, the, you know, the cortex. Now we start to divide up the cortex into fun parts, all right? So the and they have these names that are like, what? Dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, all right? There's a big mouthful. Dorsal, dorsal meaning, you know, uh, like, sorry. Um, there's certain gestures I just shouldn't do. <laughs> um, I, should, I should just tie my right hand out. It's next to the microphone. Um, dorsal, meaning up, up here, all right? So you see there, the image in the, of the, you know, the back front top of the cortex, all right? So, um, very important for social cooperation, decisions involving, you know, others and being with others, getting along with others, interacting with others. The frontal cortex, uh, we, you know, learned maybe first and foremost from the Phineas Gage case, is largely about impulse control. That uh, 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 maybe, you know, a, a problem, about half of your net, about half of your neurons in your brain are excitatory. In nature and half of them are inhibitory. Um, frontal cortex is largely inhibitory. It seems like its major function is to inhibit all those, you know, emotional centers down below, like the amygdala and hypothalamus and uh, the whole limbic system. All right. So it's about impulse control. It's largely about, hey, you know, selecting from a wide repertoire of possible behaviors, both like, you know, actual physical behaviors and, you know, what you do, what you say. Um, it's about impulse control, decide what not to do, all right? Don't do this. Don't act out on every frenzied, um, you know, emotional outburst. All right, orbital frontal, I'll point out in a moment where that is, um, orbital. Um, if you, if you just, just, you know, orbital, I, I, orbital, you know, orbital kind of sounds like the shape of the eyes, okay? So these are like the orbital frontal cortex is like that part of the cortex, that bottom front of the cortex, right? above your eyes, okay? So that's maybe your way to remember where orbital is. And I'll show you on a slide or two where it is. Um, it's really, it seems to be involved with what are called um, making decisions about consumable or rewards, all right? So deciding, you know, making decisions about what to eat, what not to eat, um, um, uh, you know, things that you consume. Um, We've talked before about the anterior cingulate cortex, all right? That's up there, you know, one of the first folds of cortex around the limbic system. And um, it's really heavily involved in those cost benefit kind of decisions, right? Everything, you know, it's about a cost benefit. Should I eat this or not? Should I ask this person out or not? Should I, should I, should I, should I go to class or sleep in? Should I, you know, go out tonight or stay in and, and study? Cost benefit decisions, both simple and complex. Um, that structure takes a lot of that role. All right, now this is the fun surprising part, the striatum. Um, the striatum is like a big thing. It's like a network and it's this, you know, it's this set of structures highlighted in red here. And sometimes it varies. Some people, you know, it's, like, it's part of the basal ganglia. It's the part of the basal ganglia I have not mentioned. All right, when I talk about the basal ganglia in the past, it's largely been about movement. You know, it's 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 role in movement. Well, movement is about deciding. You know, I, I, I kind of hinted at it. Uh, uh, you know, it's it's you know the basal ganglia is about deciding which movements to do and not to do. Maybe more so in which ones not to do. You know, right now your 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 um, basal ganglia is like not jumping 
out of your chair, you know, deciding like, don't just run up and jump out of here, run screaming to the door. Okay. Um, so I didn't mention the striatum. The striatum is also listed as part of the basal ganglion. It's a big, you know, it's a it's a big set of structures, and it's got it's kind of like this internal set of structures, you know, in and around the limbic system and in and um, you know below the the the, the cortex. And um, I wish I had another image of it because it's kind of more about the network connections than the globs, you know, the the centers where it is. Um, so yeah, it receives input from all those structures I just said and, and, and others and connects you know, from them and to them. And um, you know, it's, it's said to provide common value you know, to things, all right? And again, you know, being, you know, amongst that movement decision part of your brain, it's like deciding what, not, what to do and what not to do, literally behaviors, you know, what, what to say, what not to jump up and do, okay? Um, so another part that's a set of structures that are important in making a choice are the lateral intraparietal area. Okay, and I'll show you on the next slide where that is, parietal, parietal cortex, right? So that's a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a zone that's like, wait, what? Parietal cortex? I mean, you always think, you know, so far everything's been up there in the front, okay? Um, we always talk about the, you know, the frontal lobe is like, hey, that's where all the human, you know, like decision-making, thinking, reward stuff is, all right? No, um, the lateral, uh, inner parietal area, okay? Um, sometimes called the lip, right? It's going to be focused on perceptual choices. What do we mean by that? Um, the decisions that you make based on perceptions that you're having. Get, you know, the parietal lobe, what's it doing? It's that, you know, it's a, that, that it, especially sensory perceptions, okay? Um, it's getting a flow of information from the visual cortex behind it, all right? So it's visual perception as well, especially, you know, the, right, the parietal, lobe, the parietal lobe is about largely, you know, sensing your body, knowing what parts of your body are yours and what's the chair and everything else, you know, how, separating you from other people and other things, knowing what you are and knowing where you are, where your whole body is, where your hand is right now, where you're fitted, you know, where's your ear, where, where are your parts, where, you know, what is yours and where is it, okay? Um, and, you know, when you're making decisions, especially that basal ganglia, the striatum, you know, it's deciding what to do, what not to do, it's got to know where those things are, okay? So, you know, um, if you decide to write this note down right now, your striatum's helping you, you know, your anterior cingulate cortex is like, hey, this is maybe a very important point, write this down. Um, basal ganglia is like, okay, don't jump up and walk away. Don't put your pen down. Instead, grab your pen, write the, you know, uh, on and on and on. Okay, so, you know, and then where's that pen? Where's that paper? Uh, where am I right now? <laughs> okay, all that kind of, you know, primal cortex stuff too. Okay, so, um, Here's another slide that shows where a lot of this stuff is, okay? So um, yeah, here's a whole big chunk of structures that are associated with this like this quote unquote decision-making, all right? Um, I didn't say a whole lot about the medial prefrontal cortex, right? The middle prefrontal cortex, when you kind of fold the brain apart, you see the medial part up here. There's that orbital frontal, it's like the, the bottom front of the frontal lobe. There's that singular anterior cingulate cortex. Um, what's the blue here? That's like this. That's what that that's that's the anterior cingulate cortex. That's that arrow is just not going quite down far enough. Um, um, oh, the nu nucleus accumbens. God, I love that little nugget. Okay, that look at that little book. You know, right up the, above the. Uh, you know, it's right. In, it's. You know, I'm just realizing I don't remember if it's part of the hypothalamus or just in front. I think it's just in front of the hypothalamus. This image makes it look like it's right in the middle of the hypothalamus. The nucleus accumbens. What does that guy do? Um, 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 it, you know, if this this slide is saying, hey, it aids in decision making. All right, um, um, it's a. Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, it, it reminds me of the amygdala sometimes, like nugget, you know, size for size. It's like one of the like most connected, most important little nuggets in your head, right? Um, nucleus accumbens, like anything that you find rewarding, like you know, coming into class, um, you know, um, it's a very dopamine rich, you know, nucleus, and um, so it's very, you know, it's another one of the reward centers and um, making decisions based on like, hey, I like this. Okay, so um, 
nucleus accumbens. And the substantia nigra, there's another surprising little nugget. Way back here, we you know, haven't really talked, we talk about substantia nigra when I first talk about one of these like midbrain, hindbrain structures, okay? Um, substantia nigra, it's black, it means it's, it's, you know, black substance, it's blackish, okay? It's got a lot of, um, it's got a lot of connections with movement, okay? Parkinson's is associated with this, you know, de um, depletion of do dopamine uh, connections from the substantia nigra to other parts involved with movement. So again, I just, you know, it's part of, you know, decisions involve movements, all right? Just about every decision you make involves, a, you know, a physical movement, even if it's just thinking. Wait, what? Thinking involves movement? Yes, we talked about that. Thinking is language-based for us. You don't, it's hard for you to think without moving your mouth a little bit, okay? A lot of us talk to ourselves, and I don't mean, you know, some of us literally talk to ourselves out loud, but when you think, you're just kind of silently talking to yourself, and I did, we did that little demonstration where I told you to hold your tongue or jam it up in the roof of your mouth and, like, try saying a sentence, you know, silently to yourself, and you'll probably say it, like, as if you have your time stuck, right? We literally, you, you make little micro movements when you even just think, like, you know, when you recite thoughts, um, those are movements. And of course, everything, you know, like when you reach for the candy bar, that's a movement, okay? When you reach for the hand to write the note, to take the notes, um, blah, blah, blah. So movement centers, I got, you know, substantia nigra, it's got connections to the nucleus accumbens, you know? It's like, hey, you know, we're gonna move or we're not move. And, you know, here's, uh, yeah, so. Um, so on and so on. I mentioned, yeah, there's that, you know, I told you I would point out the, 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 the lateral intraparietal area, okay? Look, that's that junction between, you know, um, the front of the parietal cortex is about sensing parts, you know, sensing from your parts. The back of it is receiving a lot of information from the occipital cortex about vision, you know, and where are those parts and where are you and what's around you. Um, you know, that's the how and how pathway, the how and where pathway we talked about, you know, where stuff, how do I get around it? How do I navigate, um, you know, in my body parts, you know, tell where, are, you know, what are they feeling? Where are they? Um, it's also getting information. It's connected to all kinds of stuff. It's getting information, you know, sound, you know, where the sound's coming from. Okay. So yeah, you know, decisions that, you know, are about like, Hey, where's my stuff? And I talk about that. Okay. Um, the insula. Okay. I haven't talked, you know, you know, there's, there's the, um, the insula is not like mentioned in the paragraph here, but, um, the insula is this neat, like white matter connection, you know, this pathway of, from up, from top down, um, out there. Um, I skipped that at the end of yesterday, the other day I was talking about music. I started to talk about music and I, I'm not going to jump back to that, but the planet, Temporal plant, planet, temporal shit structure. <laughs> we have a, we have a, most of us have a, have a larger left um, planum temporal area, and that's part of near the insula. Okay. And uh, musicians, especially people with really, you know, better to perfect pitch, have an even larger set of those structures. Okay. Um, there's the basal ganglia that's out of structures. Okay, all right. Um, I said I would do five minutes. That was 15 or more. So, yeah, done. Get them out there. All right, all right, all right. So, hey there, you're a rock star. Yeah, here's my rock star that I want to talk about today. Is that a question or just what? No, I don't know. Huh? Oh. <laughs> um, this is Kanzi. This is Kanzi. He's a, he's a friend of mine who I've never met. Okay, I feel like I know him. Um, I have, I have, um, I have a, one of my best friends did research with him and his cohorts <laughs> at, at, when they were at the Georgia Language Research Center in Atlanta, part of Georgia State College, which was just, just part of, just in, and their lab was out, just outside of um, Atlanta. And I went to the University of Georgia and um, I hung out, most of my friends in that, pro we had a, we had a primatology program in in the biopsychology, I was in biopsychology, and um, um, I did not study primatology. I didn't take any primatology classes, but um, several of my friends, you know, several of my best friends in grad school were in that program. So um, Karen was not, but um, I, I'll, I'll, 
doesn't, well, I met her working at a different job when I started teaching at a, at a college in Atlanta. And um, so anyway, she's given me the tapes that I'm gonna play segments of today. All right, so um, this is Kanzi today-ish. This is a fairly recent photo of him. This is not the Kanzi you're gonna see in what I'm gonna play. What I'm gonna play is fucking old, all right? So it's from the, God, it might even be from the 80s or early 90s. Um, so anyway, Kanzi's birthday was what, about a week or two ago, and um, he's 42 years old now, all right? Born in 1980, so he's older than you, all right? So, um, um, I'm going to, this stuff is, is in this PowerPoint, which I will make sure it's on the course site. And I don't think some of the, anyway, I'm not going to, um, take class time now to watch these, these other videos. All right. So these, these, these two other videos, I would, I hope you'll watch because they're cool and fun, um, are about other animals and studies research that's done with them about intelligence. All right. So there's sea lions and this. Alex the parrot, Alex the parrot, oh my God, everybody loves Alex the parrot, okay? Watch that for Alex. Alex is, um, Alex is, you know, like, you know, an African gray parrot, you know, they can they can speak and mimic speech and everything. And so um, this hand is Irene Pepperberg, and she's a, she's a psychologist at, at Arizona State University, and she um, worked with Alex until he sadly died. And, um, and um, in this task, that, I'm just gonna, I gotta mention this task. So, they, she's showing him all these different objects that are different colors, different shapes, and made out of different things. So Alex, she does she did research like you know do does this animal understand concepts? Concepts are you know simple things for us, but they're you know they're complex. They're complex. Okay, so she's demonstrating with you know for the for the for the camera. Um, she, she holds up an object, she goes, you know, she holds him up all these objects, shows them to all, and she asks him, which object four corner blue? That's what you, you have to talk in kind of weird ways to a parrot, but which, which, what matter four corner? The question is, what matter four corner blue? In other words, what matter is the four cornered blue object made of? That's a fucking complex question to ask a college student. Okay. <laughs> There's six or seven objects on there, and the question is, which what is the four cornered blue object made out of? All right. And Alex can tell. Okay. Um, you know, and the answer is wood correctly for the, you know, for the camera. He just takes a look at, she has to ask him a couple of times, but he's looking at it and he finally goes, wood. He recognized, you know, there's only one four cornered blue object and it's made out of wood. Okay. There's multiple blue objects, there's multiple four cornered objects, but there's only one that's um, four cornered and blue. Okay. And uh, it's made out of wood. Okay, so anyway, watch that and other animals. And so, um, I'm going to get to this to to to, to Kanzi, that research. So um, Kanzi's made it into Time Magazine several times. <laughs> um, this is similar to the image that's in your textbook about him. So it's just kind of your textbook, just sort of like, hey, this is Kanzi. It doesn't really talk much about the research. Just you know that some research has been done with animals on language and. Um, this is Sue Savage Rumbaugh. And again, this is the video that I'm going to show you is from when they were at the Georgia State Language Research Lab. And um, it's since moved to Iowa. And, um, and, Sue, and Sue has been and is and continues to be a very controversial person. She's done brilliant research, but she's done brilliantly unethical, questionable things. And she no longer works with these animals. Um, she's been squeezed out. I don't know what she's doing. She's probably, she's plenty, I'm, I'm, she, I imagine she just retired, but because she's plenty old enough to retire. So anyway, um, she's controversial. And why is she so controversial? Um, this is then, this is, you know, early days. And um, these bonobos can't speak literally. I mean, they just don't have a vocal apparatus. You know, lots of efforts with chimps and bonobos. Bonobos are a kind of, they're, they're not a kind of chimp. They're a separate species from chimp. They're, they're, they're our closest relatives. And many people have never even heard of bonobos. Um, they, we have bonobos in our zoo, and I still haven't been to our zoo yet to see them. But um, um, we're a rare, rare zoo that has bonobo, bonobos. Most zoos, they, well, they're rare. So many zoos just don't have the option. But many choose not to have them because they're very sexual, all right? They're, they're very peaceful, you know, reg regular, so-called regular chimps are, you know, they, they're kind of violent, okay? They're, they're pretty temperamental. And um, 
they're a little, they're a notch further away from us. They're very close, but um, bonobos are even closer genetically to us. They're our closest relatives. And um, they're very peaceful and they resolve things with sex, okay? Uh, everybody's making moves on everybody else in the troop, okay? And so like you can imagine like you taking your kid to the zoo and it's like, mommy, mommy, why is that? Why is that monkey trying to get, jump over that other monkey? <laughs> you just can't seem to jump over that monkey. It keeps trying. <laughs> um, you know, they, uh, yeah, it's hard to explain their behavior sometimes. So anyway, that's that. Um, this was what I call the bad years, all right? Um, this is this is Kanzi, and this is another, um, another bonobo named Pan Venetia, who's in the video. And, um, um, was Karen's favorite. Um, do they look like gorillas to you? Yeah. They should not look like gorillas. They're just morbidly obese under her care. And you, when you watch the video, you'll understand why. Everything's about food. Everything's food reward. They're always eating. It's just, she just fed the fuck out of them. All right. They're just, they're morbidly obese in the 90s or whenever this was. Um, and when she moved with them, when they moved to, the, you know, from Georgia to the uh, uh, Iowa, and that Iowa center had, you know, went to different owners and names, and you know, it was, you know, and, and it's finally settled into a good, you know, it's been for I don't know, ten years now. It's been a five, ten years now. It's been a, a, a great looking facility, and Sue's not involved with them anymore. Um, but she did move up there. And at what, so like one of the main things that finally squeezed her out of you know, control was it's like, she, as you can see, she did stuff with, you know, she just did stuff you're not supposed to do with these animals. She took them out. She, you're going to see like in, in the video, she's like driving in a car with them. And like, they're very susceptible to um, human diseases. All right. And the troop, the entire troop almost died from a common cold that swept through. And Pan Venetia died in that like little end, 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 endemic, cold endemic that went up. So they finally squeezed that Sue out of the picture. So I'm happy to say that the place is called the Ape Cognition and Conservation Initiative now, which is a mouthful, but that's where they are now in Iowa. And these are Maurice, look at, I mean, look at this, look at that buff dude now, okay? Look at Ben, you know, so they, they put him on a diet. <laughs> they put him back on a bonobo diet and, um, they're all, they're just, they're happy and they're healthy and they're thriving, okay? Yeah, look at, I mean, the evolution of Kanzi. I mean, he's just, just, you know, buffer and buffer, and, you know, in recent years, he, yeah, he looks great today. Okay, so here's their old website, which you won't find. And here's, what it was called the Great Ape Trust for a while, and they were kind of iffy. And then, um, then it was called the Noble Hope for a while. And now it's the Ape Initiative. And this looks like their website now. You can go to apeinitiative.org if you're curious and learn more about it. And, um, and they have a Facebook um, site, which is, you know, very um, frequently updated. You know, they, they post all the time. So um, I, I, th I started to say how you can't, they, you know, they, people have tried to teach chimps and I don't think bonobos, are, by the time they study bonobos, they knew, hey, they can't talk. They don't have the vocal apparatus. They cannot, they sound more like squirrels. They do. When you watch the video, it's like, you know, they're squeaking and chirping. They sound like squirrels. They, so they can't speak, but they definitely obviously can understand language. Okay. Um, so Sue um, initiated these like way before iPads and laptop computers back in the seventies, they created these, um, these panels, these big panels that it were portable, and these were all abstract buttons with abstract symbols on them. I think 250-ish, you know, they were usually two panels like this big, you know, and they, you know, carry them around the lab, carry them outside when they went outside and do stuff. They like, and they, you know, um, the 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 bonobos would poke out, you know, they press these and it would say a word. So many of them were food words, okay. <laughs> um, but they could poke out little simple sentences by stringing together some of these words, okay. So that's how they, the, that's how the bonobos would communicate to the to the humans with words. This is my friend Karen back in the, way, the early days when she was at that lab. These are regular. They had all, they also had regular. I keep on regular. They had chimpanzees. Um, there's one of the panels, by the way. Um, so yeah, there's, there's Karen in her pre PhD days. 
Um, this is a more recent dish, not very recent. These are two other friends I knew from grad school that are at the University of Tennessee. You know, they're a married couple. They're both primatologists and they both are at the at University of Tennessee in Knoxville. And this is us at an Atlanta Braves game. Um, and I'm really proud of I'm really proud of Karen because you know when the millennium came along, 20, you know, when the you know when it rolled over to 2000, um, everybody's all excited about it being a new millennium. And, some organization put together the 100 most influential works in all of cognitive neuroscience from the 20th century and work that she did with Sue made that list. So um, she was here, uh, what, a year or two ago and uh, her husband, Jeff, there's some two of my best friends. So um, you can't read this. So I'm going to read some of this to you. So I, I asked her, um, I asked her to tell me like some story that I could share with you guys. So um, I'll read this. I, I want to read you the story. And first of all, before she could answer my, my friend Beth, you know, in that other picture, she answered one of the, she answered, she said, I always tell the story about the time you went to the LRC, the Language Resource Re Research Center, to visit and Rose, one of the researchers there, Rose asked Kanzi to tell you what happened the other day. He got up on the table, pointed to the ceiling and then hit the lexicon on the board, hit the lexicon for snake. Rose said, that's right, we found a snake in the ceiling. Apparently their pet snake had gotten out and that's where it was found. You know, I'm demonstrating an example of an episodic memory and the ability to communicate it, okay? You know, a day or two later, Karen corrected her and said that was actually Pan Benicia, not Kanzi, but anyway. Um, so yeah, one of her favorite stories, uh, um, about the time he finally caught a squirrel after stalking them for years, he leaped up uh, the trunk of the tree and put his hand around it in triumph. It gave a little squirrel scream, which freed Kanzi out. He immediately gave a bonobo shout of surprise and let go of the little guy who ran off to live another day. So much for the mighty hunter. And Karen can make the sound. She can. She she can. She can mimic. Bono, you know, she can sound like them. So she says better with sound effects. So, so yeah, I've heard her doing. It. It's kind of creepy. <laughs> she she sounds like a bonobo. <laughs> And um, there's another story. Another time, Kanzi did, deliber did deliberately hide a key that would let him out of any of the catch cages. Even, you know, so they, yeah, they have to use keys. And so they always, you know, they're smart animals. They prefer to get out if they could. So, um, um, so he, got, he, got, he got a hold of one of the keys. Even when he was asked about it, he kept it tucked away next to his body, looking innocent and even pretended to look for it. Then he stealthily pulled it out a few minutes later I think we got it from him fairly easily, but I remember being impressed at his deceit. And yes, he knew what we were asking. Um, we, we talked about and used keys all the time. So yeah, you know, so demonstrated, you know, the ability to deceive. Little children, we study that in developmental psychology until you're about four years old, little children don't lie. They don't deceive, they don't have the capacity and the speculation is that they don't have a sense of self separate from others yet. You know, they, why, why lie? Everybody knows the same things, you know, if they can think their way through it, that that seems to be the logic. Like, um, so these, so these bonobos can do as well as young children in many of these tasks, all right? Like deception. So he's demonstrating this ability to, you know, he's pretending he's looking for a key that he knows he has that he knows they're looking for. <laughs> that's a that's a wild little rascal. Um, Kanzi's an artist. I could, Karen gave me this one. I got this one in my office. This is a picture he drew. Isn't it fabulous? That's a painting he did. Um, some Japanese artist put together some Pan Venetia art with his own. All right. So Pan, Karen tells me that Pan Venetia was really fascinated with writing. She watched all of them writing all the time in their notebooks when they're doing research. And so they would give her, you know, a pad and paper and she would, if you can see that she would, you know, it's nonsense. She doesn't, you know, she doesn't know the words, but she very meticulously writes like in neat lines, just like she watched the humans do. Okay. So that's a neat example of, of that kind of you know, the artist putting together his own stuff with uh, Pan, Pan Benitez's writing. Karen hates this book, um, but I thought it was an interesting book. This woman wrote a book um, after visiting the center, meeting all the bonobos, and it's called Ape House, and it's a fiction, a fictional account of, of a troop of bonobos similar to those, and I thought it was a very interesting book, but she hates it. Um, so, 
with the, I'm, you know, obviously I don't have time to watch. I'm giving you a little teaser so that you'll watch the, the video on your own. I have, so the, the, um, this is again, oh, this is a terrible quality video. Karen gave me the video tape. And so I somehow don't, I, I, I don't know, I, you know, videotape, you guys don't even know what that is. I got a videotape because that, and uh, I somehow digitized it into, you know, and I uploaded it to YouTube way back in the day when you had a 15 minute limit, you could only put 15 minutes. So I had to divide it up into four segments. And so it's, you know, and I just never, it's good enough, <laughs> okay. Um, it was a Japanese team that came in and made a Japanese documentary, but it's in, as you'll see, it's in, uh, you know, they have an English um, narrator. Um, so I also, she also gave me the, the more raw footage from that, you know, Sue had the, had the raw footage from that Japanese team. And then she, Sue, made a, 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 a version that never was published or any, any, anywhere. And I also have that um, on the, on the, on YouTube, but it's, it's more, you know, it's just, it's not as, yeah, th this, anyway, I'm going to play some of this and shut up. Um. His vocabulary runs to several hundred words and he can follow simple conversations. His name is Kenzie and Kenzie is an ape. I'm going to help get some sticks. Good. I need more sticks, too. I have a lighter in my pocket if you need one. You can get it out. I hope I have a lighter. You can use the lighter to start the fire. He may look like a chimpanzee, but Kanzi is a bonobo a closely related species from the forested Congo region of Central Africa. Bonobos are highly intelligent and physically similar to human ancestors whose remains are found in this cradle of mankind, the Great Rift Valley of East Africa. In the mid-70s, a three-and-a-half-million-year-old human skeleton was discovered in the Rift Valley. She was named Lucy for the Beatles song, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, which happened to be on the radio at the time. The hominid Lucy and bonobos like Kanzi share a remarkable number of features. Their limb proportions and the way in which they walk are similar. Which returns us to Kanzi, the bonobo who shares features with our own human ancestors. Working with Kanzi sheds light on our evolutionary path out of ancient East Africa to the full global sweep of the whole modern world. Georgia State University's Language Research Center, Kanzi's home, is set among 50 wooded acres just 20 minutes from downtown Atlanta. Researchers here study language development in human children by comparing it with language development in our close relatives, apes. Kanzi, working on word tests with Dr. Rose Sevchik. Yes, very good. Kanzi is distinguishing spoken words. First, the researcher says a word. Balloon. Balloon, yes. To answer, Kanzi presses a picture symbol, which triggers an electronic voice. These 256 symbols bear no visual resemblance to test words, which include adjectives, verbs, even wishes and emotions. Potato. 
The board includes abstracts like good and bad. Some human adults working with Kansi have taken a year to memorize these symbols and master the board. House. Right. Rock. Rock. Good, Kansi. Kansi? Chicken. Chicken. That's right. Thank you, Kansi. That's chicken, the food. That's chicken. Hot dog. Hot dog. in your hot food. I got the onions in a bowl. Let's go put them in our hot food and we'll come back and turn the TV on. Get your onions right here and put them in your bowl. Look, you spill some of them. Savage Rumbao has monitored Kenzie's language development since soon after his birth, 13 years ago. Let me get you a spoon to start with, Kenzie. Stir it up, please. Yeah. Will you wash this potato off for me? Could you wash the potato? You see, these are not just... Like With the water. You need to wash it in the water. You're responding in real time to conversation steps, requests. And That's very good. Put some water in the pan for our noodles. More water. More water. All right. Your noodles are going to go in here, and you can have a few of them for your tummy. Anzi, could you turn the water off again, please? Turn the water off, please. How did Bonobo evolution get here from here? Bonobos and chimpanzees live in Central Africa. But whereas chimpanzees range from rainforest to dry savanna, bonobos are restricted to dense jungle, virtually encircled by the arcuate course of the Congo River. Central Africa. Bonobo country, undisturbed so far by man. Until the 1970s, bonobos were not recognized as a species distinct from chimpanzees. They are smaller than chimpanzees and very gentle. Together, bonobos and chimpanzees are human beings' closest living relatives. Research into chimpanzees' language acquisition began years ago. This is... Nicky, do this. Trying to get... Do this, Vicky. Do this. Vicky could only produce... The scientific team used American Sign Language sign as a way of overcoming apes' inability to vocalize. Sign language including One chimpanzee sign learned 85 different signs. Sign something to them and then would um, feed it back. He's a psychologist, not, not at the time, not convinced that they're that they're they're really demonstrating. Like you know, he thinks it's just classical condition. You know, they're just conditioned, and they're these are kind of almost circus tricks. But um, either the same sign or. Austin's getting ready, Shelley. Doctor Savage Rumbaugh tried a method whereby apes could not imitate humans. This is this is Austin, another one of the troop members, who's kind of a control animal. Um, so they don't do much training with him. And so they're trying, they're, they have, you know, someone off outside of the lab speaking with, uh, over the headphones is, is telling him the names of objects. And he's got these photos and <clears throat> can he, 
uh, you just heard Kanzi doing that, you know, the, oh, people outside were talking and saying grapes, he could press grapes and slightly similar task. Now he's just got to pick up a picture, the correct picture. Um, and he can, he could do this too. When like, if Sue was asking him standing, like something weird, like he could do it when the person's in front of them, but he's failing. He can't, he can hear just fine, but he just, there's some, there's some disconnect here that he, you know, uh, um, he's not as trained. So there's just an extra level of abstractness when it's just a disembodied voice coming to him from nowhere. He just, he can't put that together and it give the correct cards. Okay. Um, so to just demonstrate like this isn't a universal thing. It, there's something special about Kanzi. Now then they, you know, then they go on with, here's Kanzi doing almost the exact same task and he's a hundred percent. He gets it, he gets, you know, so Someone off camera is talking to him through headphones, which you can't see her on his head. And Sue's behind him and not giving any cues. Um, and she can't hear the words either. He only, you know, he only he can hear. Uh, oh, wait, she, oh, wait, no, she is just saying the words behind him. Never mind. Same, almost the same task. Anyway, um, he's great at it. Um, and here he's gonna do, this is him doing the exact same task with the headphones and Sue can't even hear which word it is. And so she can't be giving him any cues and she, you know, he gets off, he gets it right 100% of the time. All right, we got a couple minutes left. Let's go, this is, this is his birth, talking about- Birth into the Bonobo clan at the Language Research Center. He was less than a month old when this film was shot. Kanzi is the one being kissed by a nurturing female called Matata. In Bonobo society, infants are passed back and forth among adults. The whole community takes turns babysitting. But baby Kanzi was happiest with Matata. <laughs> In the wild, adults lavish affection on the young. Matata was born in the wild. Perhaps that is why she is so fond of baby Kanzi, despite the fact that he is not her offspring. In the end, Kanzi was raised by Matata. Meanwhile, researchers were trying to teach Matata words without much success. She had baby Kanzi with her all the time, but they weren't teaching him. They thought him too little to learn. Then when Kanzi was about two and a half, the unexpected happened. He would say apple and chase. Then he would go over and pick up an apple and then look at the researcher with a smile on his face and start running around the room. So to everyone's surprise, they found that Kanzi was learning language while they were trying to teach his mother and paying no attention to Kanzi. What was happening was that he had been learning by listening to what people said and observing what they did, much as a human child might. Kanzi amazed his researchers. Apes had been taught language before, but he picked it up on his own. I like to think that was just driving around on the grounds of the, of the facility, but jeez, I don't know. All right, so anyway, I hope that was enough to interest you. You can watch, this is linked on the course page and you can, you can you'll hopefully watch this on your own. So yeah. Enjoy being able to share uh, my friend Kanzi with you. So, all right, you guys, um, it's exam week, as you painfully know. Um, make yourself proud, do well. Take Friday off, take all of your classes off on Friday on behalf of me, <laughs> okay? And uh, have a good weekend in the meanwhile. I'll see you next week on Monday.